things are not as they seem. I want to continue talking about that this morning. I've been talking for a few weeks now, and I'm trying to imprint, imprint, implant in each one of our hearts that what we see in the natural is not all there is in life. There's more going on than what we see. And God has a whole new way for us to experience life. He really does. Things are not as they seem. And God has more for us than we, than we realize than, 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 the standard, than the status quo is. There's a whole um, new supernatural way for us to live. Thanks, so. I'm just so convinced of this. If you look at what Jesus said in Matthew 13, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, or some um, authors put the kingdom of God. To me, they're interchangeable. And Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And with joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And then he, in verse 44, he tells another parable. Same topic, though. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Is your relationship with Jesus Christ such that you would be willing to sell everything that you have? To go on with God. You see, we need to, sometimes we need to evaluate. It's, it's pretty easy for us sometimes to just kind of get stuck in the status quo. Just kind of get stuck where we're at. But what Jesus is talking about here is that the kingdom of heaven is of so valuable to us that we should be willing to just sell absolutely everything and leave everything to follow him. I'm not saying we need to sell everything. I'm just saying that, that the kingdom of heaven should be so valuable to us that we're willing to get rid of everything else in this world and we, and we chase that. You see, this is not me beating you up because you're not at that place. This is me saying, there's more for you. And I'm just trying to whet your appetite to, to, for you to see what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is so awesome that you should be willing to sell absolutely everything so that you can experience this. It's a totally new way for us to live. And if you search this out, Jesus isn't talking about some pie in the sky someplace when we die that we're going to be able to experience this. No, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is among you. You see, it's here for us now is the point I'm trying to make. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the world and we're part of this. But I don't think we're attaining, I don't think we're living up to what God has for us. No. This is more than us just being a Christian. This is more of us than just experiencing life the way we have in the past. I'm talking about a whole new way to live where we're free of fear. where we experience the fruit of the Spirit, where we experience peace and joy and love in this life, where we experience what we call life in the Spirit. And over the last number of weeks, I've talked about different ways of how we can enter into what there is for us there. I think one of the main things I said is we need to take hold of this life by faith. 
We need to absolutely believe the promises of God are true. Someone told me a long time ago that if I didn't believe the promises of God, really what I was doing was calling God a liar. That got my attention. We need to really, truly believe that the promises of God are true, and they're not just true for Susie over there. I don't know if there's any Susies here this morning. I hope there isn't. But they're not just true for... Shut up, Chuck. Um, They're not just true for other people. They're true for ourselves. We need to take hold of this by faith. And then I said last week, I said, we'll never take hold of what God has for us, even by faith, if we don't learn to be obedient to what Jesus says. We need to learn to obey him if we're going to receive the life that I'm talking about here, the new way of living. We need to come to the place where we understand that obeying Jesus is very important in our life. I dealt a little bit last week where, you know, where sometimes we say, well, it's okay, Jesus will forgive me. It's okay, God will forgive me. You know, if that's your attitude, change it. Because if that's your attitude, you're going to suffer greatly from the consequences of your actions. Do you know why Jesus wants us to be obedient to him? It's not because he has an ego and he just wants us to obey him. And it's not that he's there beating us with a cane so that we obey. He didn't make up a whole bunch of rules and set a whole bunch of things in place so that we would follow him. He told us a better way to live. And he hates it when our lives are destroyed or when we destroy other people's lives. That's why being obedient is so important. So let's continue this morning. The Apostle Paul is talking about this sort of thing in in Romans. He's talking about us being obedient. He's talking about a whole new way to live, about living according to the Spirit or walking in the Spirit or use whatever words you want. Anyway, the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, 6, and 7, basically he's saying that God gave us the law to show us how to live. And the Ten Commandments are one of the examples of this. And let me just read to you part of the verses so that you can hear the Ten Commandments again. In Exodus 20, it starts out, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. You know, when we read the Ten Commandments, did you notice that most of them say what you're not supposed to do? But what happens when you know what you're not supposed to do? Think of it this way. You come into, a little child comes into your home and you're my age, so you've lowered all of your nice stuff, so now it's down (laughs) on coffee tables, etc., etc. I don't think we have anything on our, well, we don't even have a coffee table upstairs, (laughs) but let's just pretend we did for a while, I guess. But you know, you have the nice stuff. Sometimes you have nice stuff on coffee tables, right? And then a little kid comes into your house, it's two years old, and instantly your mind goes, oh man, I don't want him breaking that figurine or whatever it is there. So do you know what we're tempted to do? The kid walks in the door and he's taken off his shoes and you say, make sure you don't touch what's on the coffee table. Guess what you're doing? You're setting it up for him to, 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 do, to take what's on the coffee table and to, and to mess around with it and break it. Right? Come on. So if... 
For us, right, when God says don't do something, we're not that different than the little kids. When God says don't do something, that just makes that our focus, and then we want to do that. We know what we're not supposed to do, and so it just makes it that much more appealing for us to do that. In Romans 7, 18, um, the Apostle Paul is talking about that. He says, although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. And I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I don't want to do. Can anybody identify with this? Now, when I do what I don't want to do, I am no longer the one who is doing it. Sin that lives in me is doing it. Jump down to verse 24. He says, What a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from my dying body? You see, the problem is we know what we're supposed to do, but we don't want to do it. And the more we know what we're not supposed to do, the more we want to do what we're not supposed to do. You guys are all so holy and so... And I know you can't identify with me at all, but hey, if nothing else, I'm talking about myself, okay? Chuck, yes, you are this way. So what, what's, the, what's the solution, Charles? <laughs> the answer. The answer. I thank God Verse 25, I thank God that our Lord Jesus Christ rescues me. Jesus rescues us. He rescues us from ourselves. You see, the sin nature that we have, that Paul was talking about, the sin nature that we have that wants to make life all about us, that wants us to just live selfishly, When we become Christians, when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, and when we say to Jesus, I want to follow you with all of my heart, when we say that, we need to understand that we're given a new nature and the sin nature is defeated. And you know what else? And this is really, really cool. You know what else? The Ten Commandments become the Ten Promises. You give your life to Jesus Christ, and it's no more, or no more, you shall not murder. It's you shall not murder. The Ten Commandments become the Ten Promises. There was a man who, I, I, repeating the story, I heard another pastor um, share it on the internet, actually. He shared a story about a guy who had just got let out of jail, and he wanted a fresh start in his life, never been to church, and he walked in to a big church that was on the corner, didn't know, you know anything about churches, but walked into the church and And wouldn't you know it, in the front of the church, there was um, five commandments on one side of the front and the other five commandments on the other side. And he felt guilty and he didn't even want to read the commandments because he knew that he'd messed up, but he wanted to have a change in his life, right? So he's there. About halfway through the service, he started to read the Ten Commandments. And he realized that the Ten Commandments weren't there anymore to make him feel guilty. The Ten Commandments were actually promises to him that he would not act that way any longer if he gave his life to Jesus Christ. You see, when we walk in the Spirit, when we walk according to the Spirit, and I'll talk a little bit about more about this later on. But when we give our life to Jesus Christ and we start to follow Him and we take our eyes off of what we shouldn't do, 
but we put our eyes on Jesus Christ and start to follow him, he changes our heart. And then all of a sudden, it's not that we have to do things. It's that we get to do things. What a better way to live. We get to make the right choices. God puts his spirit inside of us. In Romans 7, 18 to 20, he says, Although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I'm reading, uh, I'm way ahead here. Forgive me, you guys. How many of you didn't get that, so you need me to repeat it again? If you go to Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul tells, talks about what I'm saying. And he uses the words flesh to describe our sinful nature. And he talks about walking according to the Spirit. That's basically what I'm talking about here. Walking according to the Spirit is a new way of living that I'm talking about. And he talks about our old sin nature, but he says that's been put to death. And we have a new way to live, the way of the Spirit. In Romans 8, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of, our, because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. What an incredible thing that this is. There is no condemnation for us when we give our life to Jesus Christ. We can live free from condemnation. This whole new way for us to live is there for us. Just knowing how to act wasn't enough. But Jesus came and set us free from sin's control. And this maybe sounds too good to be true, but it is True, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you're obedient to Him, and when you start following Him, or you start walking according to the Spirit, as I'm talking about this morning, Jesus sets you free from sin's control. And this is absolutely true. This is absolutely true for us. But to take this step that I'm talking about this morning, you have to get past the stage where you think that Jesus is disgusted with you. You have to get past the stage where you think that Jesus probably doesn't love you because of the mistakes you've made, because of the sins you've committed, because of all of those wrong things you've done. You have to, to move on. You have to understand that Jesus Christ doesn't condemn you for the mistakes that you've made, if you're following him, if you've given your life to him, if you've repented of those things and you're willing to move on, he does not hold those things against you any longer. And you will never, should I be a little more enthusiastic? You will never enter into the life that I'm talking about here this morning if you're continually beating yourself up, if you're continually looking at those things that you do wrong, if you're continually looking behind you for all of, all of that junk that's back there, and it's back there for each and every one of us, but if that's our focus and we're beating ourselves up because of that, you will never be able to move on into the life that we're talking about this morning. 
So once and for all, you get tired of me talking about this stuff, but once and for all, we need to put that stuff behind us so that we can move on and can experience the life that he has for us now. Focusing on what's behind you keeps you from going on to what's ahead of you. Focusing on the mistakes that you've made keeps you from experiencing the life that God has for you. It is so crucial, it is so crucial that we get this deep down in our spirits, in our hearts, that we absolutely believe it. And you know, sometimes we do mess up, but man, we, we repent and we move on. Just knowing what you shouldn't do isn't enough. You can't do what you know you shouldn't do. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ has came to set us free from that old way of living. That's the law. That's religion. That's, I'm not about religion here. I'm about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm about understanding that there's a whole new world that's out there for me. That there's a whole new way for me to see life. That there's a whole new way for me to live. Where I don't need to live in fear because I know that God's got my back. That I know that things are not as they seem. What a better way to live. You know, if you go back to Romans 8 here, some people interpret the passage that I've just read that they interpret it as before you become a Christian, you're trapped by sin. And then after you become a Christian, you're not trapped by sin. And it's all over and done with. Well, how many of you has that been that experience for you? How many of you, after you've sincerely invited Jesus Christ into your life, you've never wanted to do anything wrong or never, never did anything wrong for the rest of your life? It's good. There's no liars here this morning. <laughs> you know, and you can, you can think that and you can preach that until you're blue in the face. But it's not reality. And I am far more concerned about reality than I am in some something, whatever it is. <laughs> Fill in the phrase for me. Other, inter other people interpret this passage in Romans that I just can't do what I want to do. I'm going to spend my whole life trying and failing. Life is just a battle and a struggle and I can't control anything. But you know, a better interpretation is I can't do what I want to do, but that's not the complete experience for me. And I need to understand that if I'm doing what I don't want to do, and we all go through there. But this is not a once and for all thing. This is a lifetime thing where you're continually defeating the I don't do what I want to do. Sometimes we don't even understand where we're messing up. Sometimes our spouses need to hit us on the side of the head and say, hey, I'm not being funny. Sometimes our spouses need to hit us on the side of the head and tell us, hey, this is the way you're acting. Don't you see what you're doing to other people? Don't you see what you're doing to me? Now, don't make that a, a habit. If you're always picking on your spouse, I so want to go to men and women here, but I'll leave it alone. Yes, I'm a chicken, I admit it. But you see, life, this is a this is a this is a, a battle that we go through in life, right? But we obtain victory. 
It's not that we're just there forever and ever and ever. Jesus came to set us free from those things. So stop thinking because you've messed up in one area or because the battle is ongoing in your area. Know that you can win it in that area as well too. Know you have all of heaven backing you up so that you can win. So that you're not stuck in the same rut that you're in. The promise is that Jesus Christ has set us free from the curse of sin. We've been set free from that. And yes, sometimes we mess up. But that's not the focus. Do you know we don't have to sin every day? You know, we don't have to mess up every day. And if you're expecting to mess up every day and you're just satisfied with the status quo, guess where you're going to be? Oh, Joyce, I'm so sorry. I'm a rotten husband. And I'm going to stay a rotten husband until the day I die. (laughs) You know, I really would like to change, but hey, it's just not in me. So I guess we'll just continue on in life. You think she's going to accept that? She shouldn't accept that. She doesn't accept that. (laughs) You see, so why do we accept that? Why do we accept that? when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a whole other new way for us to live. There's a whole other new way for us to experience God. We get to walk according to the Spirit. We get get to follow Jesus. And we get to follow Him and He leads us. He leads us and He guides us and He directs us to places where where our souls are restored. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. He takes us where we really want to go, even if it doesn't seem like it at the time. What a better way to live. You know... What will help us to walk in victory. What will help us to walk according to the Spirit. Is for us to come to the place where we understand that we don't have it all together. Sometimes. In some areas, we don't have it all together. You know, when we don't have it all together, do you know what we do? We blame other people. And you won't be set free. And you won't be able to move on as long as you're blaming other people for your actions. Well, I am the way I am because my mom or my dad. And yes, your mom and your dad, what they did to you sometimes is absolutely terrible. I'm not diminishing that. But you know what? You're not just a product of your past. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, He gives you a whole new future. But you have to come to the place where you take responsibility for yourself. You have to come to the place where you take responsibility for your own actions. You know, I used to, I used to drive a truck and that's when, back in the days when men were men. <laughs> Not wimpy boys like they are today. <laughs> Joyce is telling me to be careful, so I better hear. <laughs> no, but we used to, we'd put about 25 tons of small square bales on semis. Took a couple hours. Wasn't that big of a deal when you learned how to do it. 
but you worked hard. And then when you're hauling the bales, you know, you have to be a little careful because the load's 15 feet high and it's kind of top heavy. And, and so you drive around a corner too fast and guess what? The bales fall off. You take a corner too short and the bales fall off. And then you really have a mess on your hand. Do you know how many guys were willing to admit, you know what? I was driving too fast around the corner and the bales fell off. Oh, I was just driving the speed I was supposed to. And then there was this big gust of wind. and <laughs> I was driving around the corner and somebody cut me off and, and I had to... Guys never admit it. You know what? Sometimes you just have to admit, right? And let me tell you, in your, as you're, in your life with Jesus Christ, as you're following Jesus Christ, you have to come to the place where you stop blaming other people, you stop blaming your circumstances, you stop blaming your job for the way, you, your boss for the way you are, and you take responsibility and you accept responsibility. And when we have that same attitude when it comes to sin, and we come to God with that attitude, you know what? Then He can work in our life. Then we're putting ourselves in a place where He can work in our life. Then we're putting ourselves in a place where we can walk according to the Spirit. I wish I had better words to use, but where you can live a life that's pleasing to God and pleasing to you. Or you can be following Him wherever He wants you to go, wherever He wants to take you. You know what you will find if you're really willing to be broken before God? You will find nothing but love and acceptance. And I submit to you today that when you're really willing to allow yourself to be broken before God and admit your failures and admit your faults and you go and you ask God to change you he will wrap his loving arms around you you will receive his love like you've never experienced love before and he will set you free and he will deliver you from that very thing that's keeping you in bondage You see, what I'm talking about this morning, what I'm talking about this morning are promises to us. And like I said before, we need to come to the place where we understand that the promises are the promises. And if they're not true for, for us, if they're not true for you, then the only thing to say is that the Bible isn't true. And that God is lying to you. If the promises that God has in Scripture, I'll say it again, but I don't want you to misunderstand me. If the promises that are in Scripture that apply to you, if they're not true, then God is a liar. He isn't a liar. He isn't a liar, and the promises are true for you. And if you're not experiencing walking in the promises that He has for you, it's not because they're not true. It's because you've got to learn some stuff. And I don't mean God is teaching you a lesson. I'm, t I'm saying that, well, He might be teaching you a lesson, but not in the context that you think I'm talking about. I came to the place in my life a long time ago when I was about 24 years old where I just had to be absolutely honest. 
And I said, I am not experiencing what's in the Bible. That made me so hungry and thirsty for what was in the Bible that I put myself in a place and by God's grace, He allowed me to start to experience those stuff, those things. You see, it's good for us to be dissatisfied sometimes. And it's good for us to, to push into the more. Look, look, at, look at what he says in Philippians chapter 3. He's talking about what I'm talking about here. He starts off with, he says that the Apostle Paul's talking about himself. He says he forgets what's behind and he presses toward what is ahead. And then in verse 20 of Philippians 3, He's talking to us. He says, we are citizens of heaven where Christ Jesus dwells and we're eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Do you see yourself this way? You absolutely need to. There is victory for us. Jesus has already provided the victory for us. Jesus has already given us everything that we need. Peter said that we have everything that we need for life and godliness. It's there for us. It's there for us. But I like the way Paul puts it back in Philippians 3.16. He says, only let us live up to what we've already attained. It's already been given to us, but we need to live up to what we've already been given. We need to start walking in what we've already been given. A whole new realm is available for us. Jesus' death on the cross paid the price so that we can have access to God. Our sinful nature is defeated. In Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. I no long, it is no longer, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And now, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the Spirit and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it's there for us. There's a whole other way to live. And if you're questioning about the sort of thing that I'm talking about, you know what's a really good... Why did I put that on my finger when I'm in front of everybody here? Do you know, do you know what, <laughs> I can't believe I did that. <laughs> you know, if you're questioning the sort of thing that I'm talking about here this morning, read the Sermon on the Mount. Because really the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus describing a person who walks in the Spirit rather than who walks according to the flesh. I don't have time to go through all of this stuff. But Jesus says things like, don't do good deeds and brag about them. You see, that's about you. If you're doing good deeds and you're bragging about them, right? Then, then that's about you. And Jesus goes on to say that same thing. He says, if you're bragging about the good deeds you're doing, that's your reward. So the recognition you get Do you know what I did yesterday? I saw this person on the street and all I had was $50 in my wallet. But I gave him the whole thing. Isn't that good? You know what? If that would be true and I did that, that would be my reward, your reaction. But if I were to do that, and I were to keep my mouth shut, then Jesus says, then it's the Heavenly Father that will reward me. And He'll reward me in front of everyone. You see, a totally new way to live, to walk in the Spirit. But you know what? You know what is so freeing about this? 
is we don't have to make the results happen ourselves. We just need to do what we're supposed to do. We, we need to do what we get to do. And then God rewards us, you know? You know, all of this trying to please your boss, and I mean, you need to please your boss, right? But trying to look good for your boss, all of that stuff is a waste of time. Do the best job you can and let God reward you. I need to move on. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Um, you, can't, you can't walk in the flesh, and you can't walk in the spirit at the same time. We need to be connected to him. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Walking in the Spirit again. What I'm offering to you today is real life. It's real abundant life. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And he's not lying. Jesus told us if we're dissatisfied in life, and he uses the words hungry or thirsty. If we're dissatisfied in life, Jesus tells us to come to him. In John 4:14, 4, he says, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. That desire that you have in your heart for more of life, when you understand, when you come to the place where you understand that living selfishly for yourself is not enough, when you come to the place where you realize that nothing you're doing will satisfy you, Jesus says, if you come to him, he will satisfy you. He says, the water I give this person will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What I'm talking about this morning is a better way to live. And people, this is not complicated stuff. This is not complicated stuff at all. It's everyday just simply do what you think is right for that day. Every day, rather than trying to get even or trying to do whatever, just forgive, every day love, every day move forward. Repent. <coughs> live unselfishly. Really, that's walking in the Spirit. And when you do this, you will be absolutely amazed at what God does in your life. I'm not talking about new stuff. I'm not talking about complicated stuff. I'm talking about the life that God has for each one of us.